More than two months of mass protests in France. Why are the French so often up in arms about well, about many things? It's a kind of it's a sort of mini coup d'état. I mean, people people do say you know Macron's a bit like Bonaparte. I mean, he's 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 small and he's aggressive and he's uh, a bit and, and and he's authoritarian and he and he doesn't really he doesn't really have the common touch. A lot of this provincial France is, is as I said, quite unhappy. And left behind and angry. Behind this is in France. France? This is in France. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. So it's not. It's not the France that you see when you go on holiday to Provence or uh, Burgundy. Or, I mean, but it exists. It exists, and and uh, you know, th this is this is not tourist France. What the revolution did was to introduce the idea of the sovereignty of the people. I mean, you have this in the, in, in the United States. The people is sovereign. But in France, it, it's got a particular spin. They believe in the sovereign people. They have this wonderful word, le peuple, the people. But le peuple are real people. They are real flesh and blood people. And these are the people who go down into the streets, who demonstrate, who strike. Well, it's both the theatrics and, 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 and the frequency. In a sense, because they brought down the state, they brought down the monarchy during the French Revolution. And then they had uh, republics, and then they had empires, and all these all these regimes finished badly, apart from the last regime, the, the Fifth Republic, which has been going on since 1958. But even that is is, is meeting a, meeting a period of crisis. So, in a sense, because they um, because they do challenge the state, because um, they have ended governments and ended regimes, there's a, there's a feeling that they can do it. They have done it, and they can do it. And it's a bit like, and they are a bit sort of trigger happy. You know, they are ready to descend into the street <laughs> and have a go. Did you know that the final article of the 1793 French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen says the following, when the government violates the rights of the people, insurrection. Insurrection? Insurrection. Oh, like wow. Insurrection. Insurrection is for the people and each part of the people the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties. Although this constitution was never actually implemented, this language, this idea that the government is effectively on probation, and if the government violates the rights of the people, oppresses the people, tyrannizes the people, then... The people must go onto the streets. They must have an insurrection. They must get rid of the government. And this is the kind of thing that you know, is, it will be at the back of the French mind. Hey there, news peelers. Today is April 7, 2023, and this is Adele, your host at the History Behind News podcast. Aren't you tired of the repetitive news on TV and social media? They just go over the same dramatized developments all day long. Do you ever wonder what happened before our news? I mean, how do we get here? They say if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. So while others cover the news, I uncover its history. I call this peeling the history behind news, which we accomplish in weekly conversations with distinguished scholars who delve deep into history to give us their fascinating perspectives from our past. I'm committed to making in-depth history that are researched and written by scholars, enjoyable and accessible to everyone. So grab a cup of coffee or your favorite drink or both. And let's get into it. King Charles canceled his much anticipated official visit to France that was scheduled for the end of March. Basically, because the French president, Emmanuel Macron, told him don't come. We have ongoing mass protests here in France. France is now approaching three months of mass protests against President Macron's pension reform bill that increased the retirement age from 62 to 64. Polls show that 65% of the French people oppose this increase in their retirement age. And it's not just that, it's also the way that this bill was rammed through the parliament by resorting to Article 49.3, which allows the government to force passage of a bill without a vote, unless the parliament votes a motion of no confidence. By the way, so far Mr. Macron has narrowly survived two no-confidence votes. My guest for this episode, Professor Robert Gilday, 
explains why President Macron decided to use Article 49.3, this unpopular path for passing his bill. And it's not just this bill. According to the New York Times, in the last 12 months, this is the 11th time that Mr. Macron's government has used Article 49.3, which feels a bit, well, feels a bit undemocratic, especially to the French. No wonder they're protesting. And these protests are massive, similar to the yellow vest protests that gripped France back in 2019, before the pandemic. Although last week's protests were not as large as prior weeks, still 13,000 police officers nationwide, including 5,000 in Paris, were deployed to face and control protesters. So what's the impact of these protests that are at times volatile and others violent? Here are some examples from recent Wall Street Journal and New York Times reports. Schools were shut down. Trains and other public transportation were limited. Many domestic and international flights were canceled. Some roads and university entrances were blocked. Garbage went uncollected. More than 100 government buildings have been vandalized, and more than 800 security officers have been injured. And lawmakers from President Macron's party have received death threats. To better understand the history of French protests and their revolutionary spirit, I spoke with Professor Gilday of Worcester College at the University of Oxford. He has been studying modern French history for 40 years now, with particular interest in both La France Profonde and Revolutionary France, a scholarship that are illustrated in his books titled Education in Provincial France and Children of the Revolution, the French, 1799 to 1914. To learn more about Professor Gelde and his extensive research and publications, you can visit his academic homepage, the link for which is provided in the detailed caption of this episode. And before we get started, here are a couple of corrections for this episode, both of which are my bad. First, I accidentally referred to the 2019 protests in France as Yellow Jacket. That's incorrect. It was called the Yellow Vests protest. The second one was no accident. I just didn't know it, or maybe forgot. Apparently, the U.S. retirement age changed last year, in 2022. So, depending on what year you were born, retirement age in America can go up to 67 for full retirement. During the podcast, I incorrectly say that the U.S. retirement age is 65. Maybe you didn't know it either. So, stay with me as Professor Gilday and I peel the history behind this news. Want to make your own podcast? It's easy. Download the free Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com forward slash podcasters. It's free and it has everything you need to podcast, like easy tools for recording, editing, and distributing your podcast on Spotify and everywhere else. You can even poll or Q&A with your listeners right from your phone or computer. You can also earn money in a bunch of different ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. Start with Spotify for Podcasters today. Professor Gilday, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. Thank you for taking the time for this conversation with me. It seems as though in our news media, here in America anyway, we hear about French street protests, riots, and rebellions quite frequently. So is this an incorrect perception of the frequency of these movements in France, perhaps hyped up by our news coverage? Or is it the case that the French do in fact protest, riot, rebel, and resist more often than other countries? Well, I think you'd say, I think you'd say that the French were very theatrical in their politics. You know, they theatrical. In German, they believe in symbolism. Uh, they make references to their past. So if you, if you, if you take, if you take three or four um, dramatic moments, most people have seen images of of the of the fall of the Bastille, which was the great military prison and fortress that dominated Paris at the time of the French Revolution in 1789. On the on the 14th of July of that year, the people of Paris took that building and uh-huh. shared out the weapons. And basically, that was the end of the the monarchy's military control of of Paris, and it ushered in the French Revolution. So, as it on the one hand, it's a very dramatic moment. And you see it in many in, in every history book. On the other hand, 
and it really did kickstart 10 years of the French Revolution. If you take, I mean, a lot of your uh, listeners and viewers will have seen the film Les Miserables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Les Mis, as it's sometimes known, which is based on the, the long novel by Victor Hugo. And there are, and there are, and there are pictures of images of, of young men on, on barricades and barricades in the 19th century were well, what people did. They threw up barricades around around their neighborhoods to stop the army getting in. They used them as defensive uh, fortifications. And again, you know, barricades are, are very are very powerful images, but they also they were also at the centerpiece of all revolutions um, in Paris in the 19th century. If you take 1968, the student and work revolt of 1968. You know, you'll see images of, of of students throwing Molotov cocktails, which were basically bottles of uh, of of, uh, of petroleum or gas with a with a with a lighted uh, cloth at the end, which they would explode on hitting the ground and, and upset the police. So, you know, that, those are very dramatic images from 1968. But at the same time, you know, the workers and the and the and the students of France virtually brought down the regime. They didn't succeed. And one last example, <clears throat> 2005, the explosion of what the French call the banlieue, which are the, the suburbs of Paris. I mean, in Paris, it's kind of the opposite of many big, big cities. I mean, the the posh people live in the centre and, uh, and, the, and the kind of marginalised people live in the in the inner suburbs, if you like. Oh, you're right. That is opposite in most cities. OK. Yeah. 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 And um, and and these suburbs are run down. They're, they're very often inhabited by... Um, immigrant pop, people of immigrant origin, Algeria or, or African origin, or second or third generation of those immigrants, and they're very deprived and they're harassed by the police. And in two thousand and five, they exploded. And again, you you find there are there are, there are widespread images of, of of young men setting cars on fire. So again, very dramatic, um, very powerful images, but. You know, really pinpointing uh, the the kind of racial inequalities uh, at the heart of um, contemporary French society. So, is it the case that the French do protest more frequently than other countries? You think, or no, is that the it, theatrics of it? Well, it's both the theatrics and and and, and the frequency. Um, and I think I, I think I think there is a, in a sense, because they brought down. The state, they brought down the monarchy during the French Revolution, and then they had uh, republics, and then they had empires, and all these all these regimes finished badly, apart from the last regime, the, the Fifth Republic, which has been going on since 1958. But even that is is, is meeting a, meeting a period of crisis. So, in a sense, because they um, because they do challenge the state, because um, they have entered governments and entered regimes. There's a, there's a feeling that they can do it. They have done it and they can do it. And it's a bit like, and they are a bit sort of trigger happy. You know, they are ready to descend into the street <laughs> and have a go. Would would the French take offense to your use of the word theatrics, you think? Or would I French think. scholars come and say, well, yeah, that's that's what it is? Well, I think what I'm saying is it's theatrical, but it's also real. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a. I mean, you know, you you could say that you know the the protests around Black Lives Matter uh, were theatrical or dramatic, but they were also real. I mean, I think I think with any protest, the the sort of the display, the uh, display, the performative dimension. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's just out of curiosity here. Uh, it may not be all that important for our conversation. Um, I heard about a certain. French strike in the mid 1990s that was perpetrated by the unemployed. How do unemployed people strike? They don't have a job. Is 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 this an apocryphal story, or did this, did this happen in the 1990s? Well, the, so there was a, there was a big uh, movement of, of of strike and uh, strikes and protests in 1998. Sorry, 1995, and it followed an election where. Uh, the candidate who won, Jacques Chirac, concentrated on what he called the social fracture. He said there's a social fracture in French society. You know, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and I'm going to, you know, elect me, I'm going to do something about it. And he was elected against the socialist 
<clears throat> opponent, and within months, his prime minister, you know, imposed austerity, you know, cuts, wage freezes, running down public services, and that did produce an explosion. And not only not only of the old, you know, the the old fashioned trade union movement, you know, of employed people, whether in transport or public services or education or whatever. Um, but it also produced um, a movement among immigrants and people who were the so-called undocumented immigrants and the unemployed and people who were homeless. Uh, it was linked to a kind of homelessness crisis. But the French have a very interesting word, precarity. I'm not quite sure. They talk about jobs. Being could you, could you repeat that, please? Precarity. Precarity. The French word is precarité, and, and it means people who are, you know, we, we now, I don't know where you have this in the States, but people on zero hours contracts, people who are kind of employed on a casual basis, uh, semi-employed. So that these are people not so much unemployed as in, you know, I mean, there were unemployed people involved, but there were also people who were semi-employed or casually employed or with on, on, on job contracts, which were, temporary mm -hmm. so I think there's a whole there's a whole kind of you know when we think about the organized working class i mean at, you know at the front at the, at, the, at the top end you have you know the skilled organized working class but then you have the people towards the end who are who are less skilled who are less permanently employed who who who, who can be hard and fired at any moment i mean marx called it the industrial reserve army the people who are kind of employed in periods of boom and laid off in periods of bust so i think yeah it was it was it was a it was a big bang it wasn't on the scale of 1968 but i suppose it points to the, the fact that you put this out you know you it demonstrates the fact that, that every five or ten years there is there is a kind of major upset in france does this spirit, revolutionary spirit and its frequency and 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 theatrics its display does it go back to the 1789 French Revolution? Is that the inspirational and the starting point, or does it have deeper roots into French history? Well, you know, you can you can find you can find deeper I mean, periods of unrest, social unrest in French history. I mean, going back to the Middle Ages. I mean, um, those of your your you know your viewers who um, who know Paris may have come across a a metro station called Etienne Marcel, or Etienne Marcel, which is sort of near the near the Pompidou Centre. He was a sort of leader of the Paris merchants in the 14th century during the Hundred Years' War, and he led a revolt against uh, the monarchy. The monarchy was very weak at that point. It was being, you know, France was invaded by Britain at one point. The king was was captured by the English, and he led he led a kind of uprising of what you might call a, a first version of the of the French bourgeoisie. At the same time, you had a peasant revolt. And peasant revolts in France get the uh, are called Jacqueries because the original leader of the revolt was a guy called Jacques. So a Jacquerie in France is a, is, a, is a is a is a peasant revolt, and you and you had plenty of those in the Middle Ages, and then and then in the in the sort of seventeenth eighteenth century, after the wars of religion between Catholics and Protestants, you had a you had a Catholic monarchy which was trying to snuff out. The Protestant minority, and you get various moments of Protestant revolt, particularly in the south of France against the Catholic monarchy. But but those were sort of fairly sporadic. It's only when you get to 1789 and the and the overthrow of the French monarchy, and quite a powerful sort of social revolution, uh, the, the, the toppling of the nobility and the clergy who had run France for hundreds of years. And uh, the emergence of a kind of revolutionary class who was fighting its enemies both within the country and and abroad. And that from that point on, the revolution becomes the kind of founding myth of France. So ev everything subsequently refers back to the French Revolution. And there are periods of restoration. For example, the uh, the monarchy was restored briefly in 1840 and 1815. Uh, um, and there, and therefore, there are people. There are people who are kind of who who think that well, the French, we had a French Revolution that hasn't quite succeeded. We now got the monarchy back, and we've got the empire back. We've got a Napoleon uh, in charge, or we've got a republic which is a bourgeois republic which we don't like. So, 
there are always people who are dissatisfied who think, well, the revolution hasn't gone far enough. We want a different kind of revolution. But they can always trace back what they want to do to a kind of legitimacy that goes back to the revolution of 1789. And I suppose there's another thing you could add is that what the revolution did was to introduce the idea of the sovereignty of the people. I mean, you have this in the, in the United States, the people is sovereign. But in France, it, it's got a particular spin because although although they've had, you know, they've had uh, governments and they've had parliaments, there's still a feeling in France that the sovereign people is not just an abstract, it's not just an abstract expression. It's not just the idea that oh, all power, the legitimacy, of all go, the legitimacy of governments goes back to the sovereign people, which is a bit artificial. They believe in the sovereign people. They have this wonderful word, le peuple, the people. But le peuple are real people. They are real flesh and blood people. And these are the people who go down into the streets, who demonstrate, who strike, who cause... They trouble. still use that term. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, well, I think what I'm saying is that the sovereignty of the people is, a re is, is, is the sovereignty of a real people who, when they get fed up with the politicians and they get fed up with the government... They think that they have sovereignty in their hands. When they go onto the streets, they are manifesting the sovereignty of the people. And therefore, they they, they, they feel that they're, it's kind of legitimate to do that. You introduced the term uh, jacquerie in our conversation. Yeah. Is that a term? And it re refers to peasant revolt. Is that the term that's still used from time to time? Does it is it sort of inspirational for the French? Or not anymore? That's in the past. Well, I'm not sure. I, I think it's probably it's probably not used that much. But the thing is, uh, you know that the rural pop. You know, in many countries, the peasantry. You know, the peasantry is is not is not is not up for revolt. I mean, it's it's kind of people say, well, the peasantry gets you know the, the revolutions take place in the cities and yeah yeah and, and, and the peasantry cops it. But in France, there've been plenty of peasant movements. I mean, again, on the dramatic side, you can see pictures of. In the 1950s and 60s, are farmers driving tractors into into the city centre because yeah. they're protesting against you know the poor poor agricultural prices or the fact that you know the growth of large cooperatives and large farms is 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 is, is squeezing them off the land. So you know farmers have have gone on strike, and then I suppose more recently, um, you may have come across the so-called gilet jaune movement, the uh, the the yellow the yellow, yellow jacket, movement. the yellow jacket movement, yeah, 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 yeah. which really uh, kicked off in um, two thousand and and, and um, eighteen, and that and that's an interesting one because although, as I said, most mostly revolutions start in the cities and then kind of move out into the countryside or try to impose their views on the countryside or the rest of France. In this in this case, the revolution started in what's sometimes being called peripheric France, marginal France, the France of, of you know, left behind France, the France of small towns, the countryside, where it, you know, there were fewer and fewer jobs. I mean, the big jobs are in Paris or in the regional capitals of, you know, Lyon, Bordeaux, Marseille, Lille. So these are kind of left behind semi-rural areas where, you know, there, there are jobs, but they're poorly paid. Uh, People have to drive, you know, people have cars and they need to drive to work. And, and the thing that triggered it was the, the fact that the government put up the, the price of gasoline very suddenly. And in these uh, in these rural areas, you know, the you know, the, the pharmacies closed down, the doctors have disappeared, the shops have disappeared. The, you know, the schools are sometimes closing down. So this, this is kind of left. This is in France. This is in France. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay. So it's not it's not the France that you see when you go on holiday to Provence or uh, Burgundy or I mean but it exists. It exists and and uh, you know th this is this is not tourist France. This is ordinary ordinary France. And a lot and a lot of these people for example they moved they used to live in the suburbs. And then they and then when they kind of without wanting to sound racist when the immigrants moved in they moved out. And they kind of move further out. You know, they might be fifty miles from Paris or hundred miles from Paris, or you know, in a kind of area where you know it's not particularly picturesque, it's not particularly beautiful, 
and and these and these are people who feel left behind and the, and and the interesting thing about them is that they they would occupy roundabouts that was their that was their drama they would occupy roundabouts and they would hand out leaflets to motorists and then every saturday they would descend on paris or they would go to paris and they would demonstrate on the champs elysees and sometimes they throw they throw bricks through the windows of you know posh posh fashion interesting shows. so these were not necessarily parisians they were outsiders oh, yeah outsiders outsiders yeah, yeah. interesting uh, we'll be back after a short break to talk about children of the revolution the french we'll be right back what is a revolution how do we define it as you will note in the next segment i asked that question from professor gilde but in an earlier episode i asked that question from dr sohrabi of brandeis university we had that podcast conversation when mass protests erupted in Iran after the murder of Ms. Massa Amini by Iran's regime. In that episode, Dr. Zohrabi talked about the people, the people of the 1979 revolution in Iran. And here's the thing, once the people revolt and topple a regime that seemed all-powerful, it becomes really hard to control the people again. Dr. Kamari Tabrizi of Princeton University talks about the revolutionary spirit of Iranians and how, despite the brutality, the sheer savagery of Iran's regime, Iran experiences frequent mass protests. And here's a Russian phrase that I learned from Dr. Steinberg. To live like this any longer is impossible. This is a refrain repeated by Russians before their many revolutions that occurred after national crises, such as wars. The links to my conversations with Dr. Sohrabi, Ramari Tabrizi, and Steinberg are provided in the detailed caption of this episode. Now, let's get back to our conversation with Professor Gilday about revolutions and the revolutionary spirit of the French. Professor Gilday, let's open up this segment by talking about your book, Children of the Revolution, the French from 1799 to 1914. Well, it was a book that I was asked to write. Um, in the 1950s, there was a three-volume history of modern France by a man called Alfred Cobbin. And the publisher, Penguin, decided to re re have it rewritten in three volumes written by three different historians. So there was one written on the 18th century, one written on the 20th century, and I was asked to write on the 19th century. And I called it Children of the Revolution because... What struck me was, you know, one of the great stories of the 19th century is although, although as I said earlier, the monarchy was restored in 1814, 1815, and then after the fact, Napoleon's uh, fall. Yeah, so you, you have you get you have you have the revolution, you have the republic. That's replaced by Napoleon in 1789 when he falls in 1814 and 1815 because he falls twice. He's replaced by the monarchy. And that lasts until 1848. And then you have another republic, which lasts until 1852. And then you have another empire of Napoleon III. And then the republic comes back in, in 1870. And in fact, lasts until 1940, when France is defeated. But, you know, so although you've got this kind of regime change, and although you have got what people call the restoration and, and the return to some kind of conservatism and, and, and a French attempt to have a kind of constitutional monarchy in the British style, Nevertheless, <clears throat> the theme of the theme of revolution is very powerful. And what I tried to do also, which was not, I'm not sure I, I succeeded, was to look at it in terms of generations. So they were different generations uh, who had a different attitude to revolution. So, for example, you had the Romantic generation. That's the generation born uh, sort of during the French Revolution, who then became you know the great writers. And artists of, of 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 the Romantic era, and they were also the people who who kind of generated revolution in the in the in eighteen thirty and eighteen forty eight. Then later on, when the, when the revolution of eighteen forty eight is crushed, there's a lot of disillusionment, and people start to think about, you know, how come we have these revolutions and we have these republics and they fail? You know, maybe we need to get organized. Maybe we need to set up a republic which is 
which is stronger and which is stronger against uh, conservative powers and also stronger against popular revolt. And, and, and the people who set up the Third Republic in 1870, you know, organized a proper stable republic and they put a huge emphasis on education. They, they, their view was ordinary people had to be educated in not only school subjects, but in what they call moral and civic education. They, they, were try, they tried to replace religious education by civic education to try to train people to become French citizens. And that was a much more kind of technocratic, pragmatic view of, 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 of revolution by a generation that had, that had been very disillusioned and wanted to make sure that disillusion didn't happen again. So I, I suppose I tried to say, well, there were different generations of revolution or different generations of children of revolution who kind of made France uh, differently at different points through the 19th century. You and I are talking about revolution and that term keeps on coming up. How is a revolution defined? Like, how is a revolution different than, say, a riot, a rebellion, or even a revolt? There's this apocryphal line. Uh, someone comes to Louis the Sixteenth and tells him about what's happening outside, uh, uh, and he asks, uh, is it a revolt? And he says, no, sire, it's a revolution. It goes down to the fact that revolution is different than all the other stuff, right? Well, I mean, your example points to uh, points to um, the fact that it kind of depends on your point of view. So, if you, if you don't like things going on in the streets, you'll call them riots, or you'll talk about the mob. Uh, you know, the mob is bringing down civilization, and it, and and it, and it's upsetting society, and it's attacking the church and. Um, you know, but if you talk about a revolt, then you know it kind of, it's kind of got a more positive spin. But if you're talking about revolution, I would say that in order to have a revolution, you need three elements. Three elements, okay? Yeah, and I'm not. I haven't invented this myself. This is what Lenin says. So I'm just cribbing from Lenin. Lenin. So he knew who knew something about you know, who knew something about revolution. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he says you need three three things. The first thing is you need a, pop, a popular movement. So the people. You know, the, whether it's the peasants, the workers, they have to be on the move. They they kind of have to be having jacqueries or peasant revolts, or they have to be having strike action. So you need that. That's the first thing. The second thing is you need the ruling class to be divided. So the ruling class, the educated class, the professional class, uh, whatever you want to call it, you need a portion, an element of that ruling class to break away and to put itself at the head of the popular movement. Mm, that's very discerning. So example, the French Revolution, people like Robespierre, Danton, those French revolutionaries were themselves middle class, but they put themselves at the head of the revolution. If you go into the 19th century, Marx, of course, was middle class, but he, he said that, you know, the social, uh, socialist parties would be formed of, you know, they, they would be led by intellectuals, middle class people, who would put themselves at the head of a popular movement. So that's just, because if 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 the ruling class is united against the popular movement, that popular movement will fail. It'll be put down. Uh, for example, as as such popular movements was were put down in Britain in the early nineteenth century. I don't know whether you come across the Peterloo massacre of eighteen eighteen nineteen. I mean, the you know workers and Manchester workers were kind of crushed by the bourgeois militia. Uh, and um, so, if 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 the middle class, if the ruling class holds together against popular movements, the popular movements won't succeed. And the other thing you need for a revolution to succeed is a, what you might call a crisis in the state. So the state uh, is in difficulty. Often, this is as a, as a result of a defeat, a, def uh, a defeat by a foreign power. So, for example, in seventeen eighty nine. France wasn't exactly defeated, but it had it, it, it was in deep financial crisis as yeah. a result of when it got involved in the American War. And so, um, but you know, for example, 70, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution of, 70, of, of, of 1917 is, be is because the Russian state collapses as a result of the First World War. So, so you have a crisis of the state, which is both kind of material, the state, the state isn't functioning anymore, and also in terms of legitimacy, the state loses legitimacy. So if you have all those elements together, popular movement, division in the, in the ruling class, and the crisis in the state, then you're likely to have a revolution. In the 1789 French Revolution, which uh, went on for some 
almost a decade and led to Napoleon's rise. Um, a document came out of that that is, I think is really interesting, and I want to know what <clears throat> impact it has had in French history. The title of the document is Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. What is this document about? Is it like similar to America's Declaration of Independence that sort of continues to inspire Americans? Yes, it, I mean, basically, it's the preamble to the Constitution. Oh, the, so the current when, Constitution. Well, no, the then, well, the then, so when the French Revolution happened, you had the, um, the, the, the king had summoned something called the Estates General to help him out with his money matters. And the Estates General was divided into a chamber for the clergy, a chamber for the nobility, and a chamber for the so-called Third Estate, which is everyone else. And what and one of the first acts of the revolution was to make that to abolish those divisions and to set up what was called the National Assembly. And the National Assembly decided that it would not separate, it would not be sent away until it had made a constitution. And the constitution, the first constitution, mm -hmm. came out in 1791. But from I think it was the, I think it was October 8, 1789, they had a declaration of of uh, the rights of man and of a citizen. And that was, in a sense, the kind of preamble, the blueprint, the, 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 the fundamental principles of what the new French state uh, was going to look like. And, and, and the basic element was, the first thing it said was, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. And that's very, that's very, that's very similar to what the Declaration of Independence says. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah, yeah. That they are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. And then, so first of all, everyone is equal, everyone has these rights, and then you have a list of these rights. So, for example, uh, the, in, in the United States, these are rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in France, these rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Oh, I love that fourth element, resistance to oppression. Okay. Resistance to oppression. And interestingly, there was another because the French Revolution went through so many phases and got more and more radical. So the monarchy was overthrown in, in 1792, the king had his head chopped off in 1793, and then a new parliament brought through a new constitution, the constitution of 17, 1793, which was uh, paradoxically never actually implemented because the constitution was suspended so long as the war was going on. But this is what this is what um, this is what the final article of of the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen of, of, of 1793 says. It says, when the government violates the rights of the people, insurrection is for the people and each part of the people the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties. Insurrection. So, insurrection. Oh like, wow! Insurrection. So, as I say, this this was never actually um, this was never actually implemented. This constitution because there was a war on. Yeah, uh, and then it disappeared and was replaced by a much more conservative constitution in 1795. And then Napoleon brought in several constitutions, and so it goes on. But this idea that although you set up a state uh, and you set up a government, it's kind of, the government is kind of on on probation. And if the government violates the rights of the people, oppresses the people, tyrannizes the people, then it's out. And the people have a right, and not only a right, it says the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties. So the people must go onto the streets. They must have an insurrection. They must get rid of the government. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, is that, you know, is it will be at the back of the French mind. I bet. Uh, that they have this, you know, that they're not misbehaving. They're not being naughty boys and girls, they have an inalienable right to... They're almost performing a duty here. A duty. Interesting. A duty to secure the rights of the people. Yeah. Government on probation. That's, that's uh, profound. We'll be back after a short break to talk about French politics, protests, and democracy. We hope you are enjoying this podcast. And if you are, then why not treat us to a cup of coffee? 
That's right. For the price of a cup of coffee, you too can become a monthly supporter of the History Behind News podcast. We rely on your support to continue this program, to continue peeling the history behind our news. Supporting us is easy. Just click the support link in the detailed caption of this episode. And while you're there, check out the information about our guests and other attributions and links. And thank you. Professor Gilday, how have French protest movements and revolutions shaped French politics? In the last segment, you talked about several different regimes. Have they all been toppled by revolutions? Is that the case? Well, as I said, um, you know, the French have this idea of the sovereignty of the people, and that's very clear. But right from the French Revolution, they had a difficulty in organizing the sovereignty of the people. They didn't know what kind of government best to have. So as I said earlier on, they tried a monarchy, they tried an empire, they tried a republic. Um, what republic are we in? Is this the fourth or the fifth? Or This is the fifth republic. Okay. Fifth Republic. So the First Republic was 1792, the second was uh, 1848, the third was 1870, the fourth was 1944, and then this is 1958. And it's been, you know, it's been around for a long time, the Fifth Republic, I mean, the best part of 70 years. Um, but it's it's kind of, um, you know, some people are already starting to think about, oh, should we have a Sixth Republic? And what would that look <laughs> like? Because... Um, one of the things about the current regime is that the is that the political class, the politicians, have become very alienated from from the people. Um, they used to be for most of the twentieth century, for example, they used to be parties like first of all the Communist Party and then the Socialist Party, which really did kind of have a popular following, and in a sense, kind of made it unnecessary for people to have so much protest because you know these parties could kind of act as vehicles for their for their uh, desires since then those part those parties have collapsed unfortunately there is a there is a very powerful party a popular party but it's the national front now called the national rally of marine le pen which is a kind of right wing uh yeah popular party um but you've also had always had in france a very powerful um kind of movement of strikes. So uh, a lot of the kind of trade union movements are quite are quite um, distrustful of political parties and don't line up immediately behind them. As, unlike the Labour Party in Britain, for example, you know, the Labour Party in Britain came out of the trade union movement, whereas the trade union movement in, in, in France was, has been very suspicious of um of political parties. Um and there's another and there's another factor which is and this is what and this kind of explains, I think, the, the 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 tensions at the moment is after the Second World War, the French set up what they called the French social model, and this meant uh, that you know employers and and trade unions would 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 negotiate wages and conditions together, and this ensured kind of job security and decent wages, and then and they also it also ensured a kind of strong welfare. Uh, a welfare system for kind of um, you know medical medical so you know medical welfare social welfare <clears throat> and since the kind of did that include a pension plan of sorts yeah yeah including yeah. pensions but but governments since the sort of 1990s have been trying you know in the, in the kind of global era and in the era of global competition French governments as as have other governments worldwide been trying to grind down these um the this kind of welfare system and this kind of select this system of collective bargaining and to go over to a much more sort of gig economy and casual work and 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 again the reduce the reduction of pensions and you might say well you know the french are having this revolt over the pension age being raised from 62 to 64 well in britain it's kind of 67 and possibly going up to 68 and i don't know what it is in the states currently the french, 65 but the French, you know, the, this is, you know, people, people sometimes say, you know, the, the British eat to live and the, and the French live to eat. And this is a country that still has lunch breaks, you know. And I've worked in French provincial towns where 
you know, you go you work in the archives and the archive shuts for two hours between, you know, midday and 2 p.m. It shuts so that, you know, the, the staff can go and have their lunch. It's unbelievable. But, you know, so it's unbelievable for an American. That's like a doctor's uh, office. Or a, or a, <laughs> <laughs> but they are, you know, they're holding on to this French social model and they're going and they, and they're going to really fight to to protect it. It, I'm trying to wrap my brain around comprehending whether or not these protests, these uh, strident voices that we see, do they reflect the sentiments of a highly active and participating minority or do they represent the majority of the French? Like are other French saying, oh gosh, another one, stop it. Or are they saying, yes, go, represent us? That's a very interesting question. I mean, I think... I think there is a kind of discontented silent majority, but the but the the, the silent majority is is, is not so silent. I mean, I think I think the example of the gilets jaunes and the, and the example of the strike action that we've seen in France in the last couple of the last couple of months, where you know everyone's been on strike and power stations have been uh, blockaded and, and the railways have, have have been on strike, and I mean this this is a really genuinely popular movement and it's and it's a movement not only you know and they're you know not only because the government is trying to take away their French social model but also because the government forced through these measures without a parliamentary vote because yeah. uh, the president macron lost his lost his overall majority uh in the elections last year so it's, it's a kind of minority government uh propped up by a kind of center right party and um, and they kind of suddenly did that. They did their sums a couple of weeks ago, and they realised that they didn't have a majority to get these reforms through. So they kind of used this emergency clause in the constitution to to force through the reforms. And then the and then and then the parliament had a vote of no con of no confidence in the government, which kind of nearly succeeded, but not quite. So um, there's a huge there's a huge amount of discontent in 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 the country, and. You know, not everyone is, or not everyone is going to go on strike. Not everyone is going to demonstrate. But um, people are talking about, you know, the, the big division in France for the last ten years, and, and particularly now, is not between left and right as it was for a long time, but between the kind of government and the people, and 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 Macron's government and his kind of rather invented party that he that, that he set up for himself. And then you know you've got. Uh, You've got a kind of left-wing party, and then you've got a right-wing party who 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 have very different approaches, but they do represent you know ordinary people. They represent Le Peuple, and you know Le Peuple is not happy. So the main political uh, positioning right now is not. I'm restating, rephrasing what you just shared with me. Between the left and right is between the government and the people. That's really profound, uh, which kind of makes me think of what you were saying. Some people are proposing a sixth republic. They're saying that the system doesn't work. And I bet uh, Mr. Macron sort of shoving through this reform without a formal vote must have been really offensive. It's a kind of it's a sort of mini coup d'état. I mean, and people and people do say you know Macron's a bit like Bonaparte. I mean, he's 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 small and he's aggressive and he's uh, a bit and, and and he's authoritarian and he and he doesn't really he doesn't really have the common touch. Are these your sentiments or are you reflecting what the French are saying? Or both. <laughs> I mean, I, I have seen I have seen cartoons of, of of Macron, you know, as Napoleon. Interesting, because of his stature. Um, well, it's not it's not just. I mean, in, in fact, you know, I mean, he has. Uh, I think he has, you know, declared his love of, of Napoleon, and um, so, you know, it's partly his stature, and it's partly, as I say, he's, he's quite, he's a quite an aggressive little man. Hopefully, he won't start any wars. In the minute we have left of this segment, I'm going to ask you a question that's a bit vague. I have to admit, uh, confess this uh, in advance. Do you think France is a better democracy because of these protests? That's a very interesting question. I mean, I think uh, I think it may be uh, a weaker democracy. But let me uh, let me let me weaker. give you a comparison. Let me give you a comparison with what happened in Britain when the Queen died. 
Okay. When the Queen died in last September, there was a very, very quick succession. And uh, town criers, you know, sort of rather, the rather sort of these kind of figures in old, uh, ancient costume, you know, rang bells and, and, and declared the new monarchy on, in, in, in the cities of England. And there were one or two, there were one or two protests. For example, one woman held up a held up a, a piece of cardboard which said, "Abolish the monarchy." F dot 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 imperialism, hmm. and she was arrested. Another guy, a lawyer, held up a piece of paper. It was a blank piece of paper. He was arrested just in case there was something rude on the piece of paper. So you know there was a sense in in Britain that you know. Suddenly, the one monarch, one monarch dies, another one succeeds, and we don't have the right to say, "Excuse me, no one asked me." You know, so I think there's a sense in Britain that you know we live in a kind of monarchical regime where it's quite difficult to protest. Although there have been lots of strikes in the last, you know, during the last winter. Whereas I think in France, there's a kind of healthy, uh, health the healthy right to protest and 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 the, and the kind of almost a love of protest and a feeling that as I say, at the end of the day, the people is sovereign and Le Peuple, you know, has got the right to go onto the streets and say we're not happy with this and we want something else. So why do you say a weaker the riots have or protests have made France a weaker democracy? It would seem what you're proposing almost. Uh supports the opposite well, that there are a stronger democracy you could you could say it makes it more responsive i mean uh there are there are pl there are plenty of cases you know in the 1980s and, and the case we mentioned in 1995 there, there are instances where the protest does force the government to pull back it does force the government to change its you know to to withdraw its reforms whereas in britain for example you know, we're about to we're about to mark forty years since the miners' strike of nineteen eighty four eighty five. The miners went on strike for a whole year against pit closures. Mrs. Thatcher just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. She would not give an inch, and eventually she defeated the miners and she defeated the trade union movement. And there's a, there's a sense in this in Britain, the government is is very reluctant to give ground, whereas I think in France, the kind of government sees the writing on the wall and. And and does give ground, and then that kind of encourages them because the next time there's a there's a there's a reform that people don't like, they're out on the streets and they've got a fifty fifty chance of having the reform withdrawn, as as is the case today. They may the, it may be that this reform falls. We don't know. Yeah, let's take a break here. Stay with me and Professor Gilday as we get into perspective. The History Behind News podcast is available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Of course, we love your reviews and ratings of our podcast, especially on Apple and Spotify. And remember, don't keep us to yourself. Tell a friend about the History Behind News podcast. Professor Gilday, what does the following phrase mean? La France profonde. I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Okay, La France profonde. It means deep France. It means provincial France. It means, I mean, France is a very centralized country. It's centralized on Paris. Um, and, you know, political life, cultural life, um, for a long time, and obviously, even today, is is very is very centered on Paris. So La France Profonde is um, is deep provincial France. And in fact, my first book, my first book, which was called Education in Provincial France in the nineteenth century, was an attempt to uh, to test that. So you know, to what extent, for example, if the government brought in education reforms, to to what extent could they be uh, implemented in in a, in somewhere like Brittany in the west or or longer dock in the south or the industrial north um so it, it it it's those it's those areas which um which are very often conservative but not also but not always they are kind of more slow moving uh, they're less industrialized they're less urbanized but i mean i think you'd have you'd, you'd now have to make 
a kind of a, a number of corrections. So, for example, there are there are big regional capitals in France. I mean, I think I mentioned a few of them: Lille, Lyon, Marseille, Toulouse, Bordeaux. These are big big regional centres. Mm-hmm. Um, and very often in France, you have a you have a, a mayor a mayor of one of these cities who was also a minister. You're allowed to be a mayor of a large city and a minister. A minister in the federal government? Yeah, I think they may have changed the rules recently, but for okay. a long time this was the case. I think they've changed. I'm the sorry, rules. I said federal government. What I meant to say is national yeah, government. Central okay. government. Yeah. yeah, central government. I think, yeah. I, I think they have changed the rules slightly. Okay. Um, um, so there are big regional censors, you know, which, which kind of, I would say... Um, Challenge Paris, but certainly uh, provide an alternative centre. And then, and then the interesting thing, I mean, we talked about the gilets jaunes, the red, the, the the yellow jackets, and the because this 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 is a movement of uh, La France Profonde, which you which has been called peripheral France. So this is the France that's been left behind, that's struggling economically. Uh, is this the marginalized France that you were talking about in the previous segment? Yeah, as I was talking about before. So these yeah. people who come up to Paris used to come up to Paris on a Saturday and um, and uh, demonstrate on the Champs Elysees. So, um, so this really becomes political. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, what I'm what I think I'm saying is that La France Profonde, you know, is not inert, and it's not and it's not it's not conservative. Um, uh, it's not uniformly conservative. It, it can get quite angry. I mean, quite a lot of the of, of left wing movements in 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 French history have come from the south. Um, so, um, I mean, La France Profonde is 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 it's quite a reassuring term. And you think of you know French provincial cooking, and you think of you know. Holidays in Provence or Brittany, yeah. yeah. um, but that's a slightly kind of rosy, you know, that's a kind of slightly rosy, uh, rose kind of rose tinted spectacles view. Because I think I, th- I think a lot of this, a lot of this provincial France is, is, as I said, quite unhappy and left behind and angry. What um, is it? well? Let me ask it this way. Is there provincial resentment towards what is perceived as Parisian elitism? Oh yes. Yeah. I mean, there's always there's always been resentment of Paris because it's so dominant, as I say, politically, culturally. I mean, you know, people used to say if you wanted to if you wanted to be a writer or an artist, you know, you had to go up to Paris. I mean, there was nothing else. Um, and and ditto uh, the the Parisians, you know, look down on people from the provinces. You know, they think they're kind of peasants or uncultivated. Or so wow. I think I think there I think there is there is quite a lot of um, of resentment. And um, you know, unlike in the United States, where you've obviously got multiple centres of politics and culture. Um, and even in Britain, you know, we have Edinburgh, we have Dublin, we have Manchester, we have, uh, and these are these are sizable capitals. But I think the thing, the problem with France is that it is very centralised, both politically and culturally. Um, last maybe night, when I was so, maybe less so than it used to be, but still, still. Uh, last night, when I was preparing uh, for our conversation, it sort of occurred to me that I can't think of another country's capital that compares to Paris in its sheer importance. Most of the countries have several cities that really sort of spread out culture, industry. Um, does anything come to mind for you? I mean, you you already compared to the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, maybe Tehran in Iran, which is oversized, uh, I, not Moscow because you got St. Petersburg, uh, mm. Ber- Berlin, you have several other cities. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just couldn't think of it. No, I, I, I think I, I think it is exceptional, and I, and I think, uh, I mean, until you know, before the French Revolution, the, the 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 king had his had his had his kind of chateau, his palace in Versailles, which is about twelve miles outside Paris, and he, and the king actually left Paris in the in the in, 
in the kind of um, in the 17th century because Paris was too unruly. So he decided to you know move outside and build his chateau somewhere else. And then when the French Revolution happened, uh, it was the women of Paris who marched to Versailles and demanded that the king and queen come back to Paris. Oh, women of Paris. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Uh, and and you know, once that happened, it meant that the government was it. The government and and the people were in the same place, and that made it vulnerable. And that's one of the, in a sense, that's that's kind of one reason why these revolutions often succeed is because because the center of the popular movement and the center of government is in the same place, and uh, it doesn't take that much to kind of invade uh, invade government buildings or parliament and uh and try and take power yeah senses of power if you wanted our audience to remember just one point after everything we've talked about just one point about the french revolutionary spirit uh what would it be well i i thought a bit about this and i don't know whether you um you saw clips of this but when um when the government tried to force through this uh pension reform uh by emergency uh, decree, mm-hmm. the opposition politicians stood up and started singing the Marseillaise, which is the which is the French national anthem. But it's a very interesting national anthem which goes back to the French Revolution. Oh wow! Okay. And if, and if I can just read you a couple, I've, I've translated a couple of lines from it just to give you a flavour of it because it's quite. It's Please. Quite, it's quite aggressive. And it, are you going to read it or are you going to sing it? Doc? No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to <laughs> terrible voice. It says, uh, so in translation, forward, children of the fatherland, the day of glory has arrived. The bloody standard of tyranny has been waved against us. To arm citizens, draw up your draw up your battalions so that the implore, so that the impure blood will soak our furrows. But it's the French national anthem. I mean, if you, uh, you know, and it's sung on all occasions, but... Uh, there was a time in the 1970s when the president tried to kind of uh, change the tune to make it a bit more kind of hymn-like and a bit more, you know, unaggressive. But it's a, it 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 was um it was drawn up at a time when you know the French Revolution had just happened. Other powers, you know, Prussia, Prussia and Austria were invading or about to invade. The, the the British were you know trying to snuff out the French Revolution. There were counter-revolutionary parts in La France Profonde, which were opposed to revolution. So this 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 is a this is um this is um this is an anthem which is which is militaristic, which is aggressive, which is about the which is about the formation of a citizen army to to destroy the enemies of the republic or the enemies of the of the revolution. Um and uh and and it, and it's sung on every occasion, and I just think it carries a, a very powerful message of patriotism, uh, revolution, um, and also pride. Yeah, I can see. I can see how the revolutionary spirit is sort of sown in their culture. It's in their national anthem. Well, it's hard to write in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Professor Gilday, thank you so much for educating me and our listeners. And to our listeners, if you know of any history that could provide more perspective from the past on this subject, please share it with us and tell us what's your perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opinions and statements of our guests are their own. We neither agree nor disagree with them. We're only interested in the perspective they provide through history. At History Behind News, we're honored that our guests share their expertise with us, most of which are based on years of scholarship and research, and we provide links to their projects and publications for your benefit to review them if you wish. Otherwise, we're not affiliated with our guests. We just think they teach us pretty cool history, the history behind our news. Also, Unless we explicitly inform you, we're not affiliated with any institutions, including Amazon, for which book links are shared here from time to time for your convenience. Finally, as a reminder, we don't do news here at History Behind News. We peel the news for the history behind it. 
And our mission is not to provide a complete account and analysis of the past, rather is to highlight some issues and incidents in our history that may poke and prod your discerning minds into seeking some perspective for our news. And if you disagree with our take on history, well then, it means we've succeeded in getting you to think about the history behind news. And of course, share your thoughts with me by leaving your comments on Twitter or sending an email to Adele at historybehindnews.com. I love to hear from you. I love to learn from you. Until next time, this is Adele with History Behind News, a history podcast for our news.